So our sermon text is going to be from Psalm 127, a song of ascents of Solomon. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Um, Lord, we thank you particularly for this psalm. Lord, I pray that through this psalm you will increase our trust and confidence in you. Lord, I pray that your word would be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I pray that you'd fill us with your spirit, give us eyes to see and ears to hear as we dig into your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So just to start and kind of see where we're at in the book of Psalms here, a little background um, from the heading. So Psalm 127 begins with a song of ascents of Solomon. And this is the eighth out of 15 psalms that are called songs of ascents. Psalm 120 through Psalm 134. So this one sits right in the middle. They're short psalms. They're very theologically robust. And they're also very easy to memorize. The Hebrew word for ascents literally means going up or goings up. Uh, Charles Spurgeon refers to these 15 Psalms as a little Psalter within the Psalter. And from what I could find, there appears to be at least three views among scholars on the purpose of this group of Psalms. One view is that the songs of ascent were simply to be sung at a higher pitch than the other songs. That was John Calvin, actually. So you're <laughs> laughing at John Calvin. So. Another view is that these 15 psalms were sung on the 15 steps of the tabernacle as the Levites went up into the temple to worship. So the Levites would sing these songs, one on each step, as they were going up to worship. And that may be the case. However, the view that is most common, and I would say most aligned with Scripture, is the third one that the Psalms of Ascents were sung by the pilgrims as they made their way up to the annual feasts in Jerusalem. You'll see throughout Scripture that Jerusalem is always up. Three times a year, devout Jews would travel up to Jerusalem for the Passover or the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then we have Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. And then we would have the Feast of Booths. And these songs would have been sort of like the family playlist as they were traveling up to Jerusalem. And this idea of ascending, and one of the reasons I think it fits better with scripture, this idea of ascending or going up on a mountain or looking up to the Lord is a main theme throughout this group of Psalms. And we see a little bit of that as we go through it, especially at the beginning of this this group. Psalm 121, verse one and two says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills, from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Um, 122, Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together, where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. 123, unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. And then in 125, we get this idea of mountains. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. And along with the idea of ascending, these 15 Psalms also depict a spiritual ascent. It's been noted that they're sort of grouped in sets of five. And the initial five Psalms, 120 through 124, will consistently highlight trouble and danger. And then in 125 through 129, we see them emphasize confidence 
and trust in God. And then the final five Psalms, which one of them we sang today in Psalm 134, will consistently refer to communion with God in his house and among his people, right? The servants of the Lord serving in the house of God like we sang today. Or in Psalm 133, we see, uh, behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. So Psalm 127, like I said, sets right at the heart of this section that emphasizes confidence and trust in God. And then you also see in Psalm 127 and Psalm 128 that they're very domestically related. They're all about the house. Um, Psalm 128, which we sing often, starts out, bless the man that fears Jehovah. Along with that, you see that it says that it's of Solomon. And there are echoes in this Psalm from the covenant that God made with Solomon's father, David, in 2 Samuel 7. So we have David, after a long period of hiding from King Saul, living in the wilderness, fighting off the Philistines and other enemies of Israel, we see that David conquered Jerusalem. He built his own house there, and then he brought the Ark of God to Jerusalem, which would also make it the central place of worship for all of Israel. And now that David was dwelling safely in his own house, he was compelled to build a house for God, specifically for the ark of God that had been dwelling in tents of curtains up to this point. However, if we turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7, we'll read verse 11, 13, we see that God told David, you're not going to make me a house, but I'm going to make you a house. Also, the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Excuse me. So Matthew Henry, Charles Spurgeon, and many others have argued that of Solomon should be understood or even translated for Solomon because this was a psalm that David wrote for his son Solomon knowing that he was going to have a house to build, a city to guard, and his own son to survive him on the throne. But there's also a strong argument. I, don't, I didn't really land anywhere on this. There's also a strong argument that it was written by Solomon. And largely due to the fact that you'll see all kinds of comparisons with the book of Ecclesiastes, showing the vanity of our endeavors if they're not under the blessing of God. So listen to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, which this is repeated twice in Ecclesiastes. Uh, Solomon says, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun. So we see a direct connection, especially to verse two and three that we see there. Let's look at the first stanza of Psalm 127 again. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Without God's blessing, nothing can be successful. Without the blessing of God, nothing can be successful. Without God's protection, you won't be able to protect it. All of your efforts will be meaningless unless God is blessing it. Remember, this psalm is emphasizing trust and confidence in God, right? He is the one who builds the house and he is the one who guards the city. So the question we ask is how do we put our trust and confidence in God to build the house and to guard the city? What does trust and confidence look like in scripture? The answer, the answer I would say, is obedience and gratitude, right? Trust and confidence look like obedience and gratitude. So true trust and confidence will always result in obedience and gratitude. Jesus gives us the blueprint for obedience in building a house, especially 
in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. Verse 24, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So you build your house, and we have to remember that throughout Scripture, the the analogy of a house is used for many different things. It's used for a family, a household. It's used for a church. It's used for a city. Um, It's used for a nation. It's even at times used for all of creation. But you build your house on the rock, the words of Christ, or you build your house on sinking sand, which is what? Right? Sinking sand is anything other than the words of Christ. Right? So you build your city, your nation, your family, you build them on the words of Christ, or you're building them on sinking sand. And notice also in this verse that both these houses look the same. Right? They look the same until the storm comes. Right? It's when the storm comes that it's revealed that one is built on the rock and one is built on sinking sand. The Old Testament is full of reminders of what happens when our building project, if we fail to obey God. Haggai was a prophet sent to the Jews who had returned from Babylonian exile, and they failed to finish building the temple as God had commanded them. Haggai was a contemporary with uh, Zechariah. Instead, they were disobedient, and they tried to build their own houses and businesses first with no success. Haggai chapter 1, verse 4 through 6 says, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses, in this temple, this house, to lie in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And listen here to the connection between uh, 127, verse 3. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put it into a bag with holes. So without the Lord, it's vanity. Everything you're doing ends in frustration, and it's because the Lord is not blessing it. You've sown much and bring in little because of your disobedience, refusing to obey God's word, and therefore refusing to build on God's word. But there's also another problem. I said obedience and gratitude were the answer to trust and confidence. So the other problem here is a lack of gratitude. It's when we build something or we're given something by God, God is blessing it, God is blessing us, and it's obvious, but we tend to forget that it was the Lord's doing and we refuse to give him thanks. God warned his people of this very thing going all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, starting with verse 11. His judgments and his statutes, which I command you today. Right, so there we have obedience. Verse 12, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and from the house of bondage. We jump down to verse 20. It says, as the nations which the Lord destroys before you, so you shall perish, because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. So what happened here, right? So the Lord blessed them. The Lord brought them into a land that was already um, flowing with milk and honey, houses they did not build. And even further than that, the Lord always blessed their obedience. We see this with Solomon whenever he becomes king after his father David. But the tendency is, is to forget, right? One pastor said of this verse, when we get full, we get full of ourselves. When we get full, 
we get full of ourselves. We forget where our help came from. God has blessed us, but we tend to think it's because of something we did, right? Look at how great of a leader I am. Look at all these people. They must really like me, right? We tend to think that the blessings are because of something we did. Um, Susan and I went to the New St. Andrews graduation on Wednesday night, and the uh, graduate who gave the valedictorian speech, although they don't call it a valedictorian, but the graduate who gave the speech, um, the title of his speech was take your work seriously, not yourself, right? Take your work seriously, not yourself, right? So we don't stand here with our hands folded and wait on God to bless us, right? We go to work, we work with excellence, right? But we recognize that success in our work, in our family, in our church, in our business, in our city, success is dependent upon the blessing of God, right? Look at how Nebuchadnezzar, we don't want to be like Nebuchadnezzar. So let's look at what Nebuchadnezzar did. Nebuchadnezzar says, whenever he had been blessed, all the kingdoms of the world were under him at this point. And he says, is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty, right? And not too much longer, Nebuchadnezzar is on his knees eating grass. <laughs> so that's not how we wanna be. So don't forget it was God who delivered you and God who blessed you. God's the one that did this and our response should be obedience and gratitude. Obedience and gratitude. Regardless of how much effort, sacrifice, and dedication you invest into something, it will be vain if God is not blessing it. On the other hand, if God's blessing is present, you obey God, you build on his word, you trust the outcome, and you render thanks where thanks is due, right? The wheels could fall off and you're still gonna make your destination, right? One pastor said the wings could fall off and it would still fly, right? When God is blessing something, you won't be able to stop it, right? When God is blessing something, it will be evident. It will not fail. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. John Calvin sums up the first stanza of this psalm at a very high pitch, I guess, but by saying, this shows that the order of society, both political and domestic, is maintained solely by the blessing of God and not by the policy, diligence, or wisdom of men. Which brings us to the second stanza of the psalm. Behold, beginning with verse three, behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. So the first half shows us, the first half of the psalm, shows us that the house is built and guarded by the hand of God. And now the second half shows us God's method for building and guarding the house, right? The first half shows us it's built and guarded by God. The second half shows us how God builds the house and guards the city. He uses children to build, right? God uses children to build and he uses grown children to guard. All right, so God builds the house through children, and he guards the city through grown children. All through the Old Testament, just talk about children a little bit, all through the Old Testament, we see that people wanted children to build their household. And it was a grief to not have any, right? We've seen this recently going through Genesis with Alan. God miraculously opens the womb of Abraham's wife, Sarah, right? Then he miraculously opens the womb of Isaac's wife, Rebekah, and this is gonna continue. We, we go to Jacob's wife, Rachel, then Samson's mother, right? Samson's mother had one child, and I think their quiver was pretty full <laughs> with one child. That's another thing. I don't think this is necessarily, um, this psalm is not necessarily emphasizing quantity, right? The psalm here is emphasizing quality. So we have Samson's mother. We have Samuel's mother, Hannah. 
Then we have into the New Testament, we have John the Baptist's mother, Elizabeth, all of these mothers crying out to God for children to build their household. And finally, as Alan has pointed out, all of these are pointing us to the barren womb of Mary, Jesus' mother. Rachel's yearning for children is so strong in Genesis chapter 30, she, yet, she proclaims, give me children or else I die. Give me children or else I die. So all through the Old Testament, people wanted children to build their household and it was a grief to not have any children. Now, what does this Psalm tell us about children? Well, it tells us at least two things and I'm kind of connecting heritage and a reward here into one thing. So first it tells us that they are a heritage or a gift. The Hebrew word for heritage here literally means something inherited. And so as you go through scripture and you see the word inheritance, it's the same word, right? This is the normal word used for inheritance. And you'll also see it in several different versions of scripture translated as children are a gift from the Lord. So the first thing, children are a gift. Second thing, children are arrows, right? And arrows here are a weapon, right? So children are a gift and children are a weapon. So if children are God's gift, then this necessarily implies two things. First, if children are withheld, then it's God who withholds them, right? All those stories that I just talked about, every one of those, it becomes obvious that it's God who is withholding the children. So if children are withheld, then it's God who withholds them. Second, if children are given, then it's God who gives them, right? If children are withheld, it's God who withholds them. If children are given, it's God who gives them. When Rachel cries out, give me children or, let, or else I die in Genesis 30, look at Jacob's response in verse two. And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel. And he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Right, Jacob knows he couldn't withhold children, right? That was the place of God. So if children are withheld, then it is God who withholds them. Then also listen to Jacob's interaction with Esau as we move forward to Genesis chapter three, verse four and five. Verse four, but Esau ran to meet him, Jacob, embraced him, fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. And he lifted his eyes and saw the women and children and said, who are these with you? So Jacob said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Jacob it, this, was, this was easy. Jacob recognized it was God who had withheld children at a time in his life. And here he recognizes that all of these children were children whom God had graciously given. So children are God's gift. If children are given, then it is God who gives them. And this is really where we are at in our culture today, right? Throughout scripture and, and even most of human history, the gift of children was the supreme gift that somebody could receive, right? Throughout scripture, throughout history, the gift of children has always been the supreme gift that somebody could receive. One modern day value that is diametrically opposed to scripture is that children are increasingly seen as a burden rather than a blessing, right? There's no modern day value. We see this playing out in abortion, we see this playing out even in sexual immorality and all the other problems we have in our world. There's no modern day value that's more opposed to scripture than that children are increasingly seen as a burden rather than a blessing. But not only are children a gift and a reward from God, right? The second thing I said here is that they're a weapon, right? Children are a weapon. The psalmist describes children here as arrows in the hand of a warrior. Let's read that again. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. 
They shall not be ashamed. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. So remember, the first stanza of the psalm said that unless God builds the house and protects the city, then both are being done in vain. And the second stanza of the psalm shows us God's method for building the house, which is through children, and protecting the city, which I'm gonna show here is through grown children. But the question here is protecting the city from what enemies, right? Who are we protecting the city from? Who are they protecting the city from? Who are these adversaries at the gate? And what is the benefit of having children by my side when I speak with them? We tend to see the illustration of arrows in the hands of a warrior, and we think of going to the gates of the city in some type of a military battle, right? Arrows are flying, bullets are flying, and there's some kind of a war going on here. But the biblical notion of speaking with your adversaries at the gate is actually more of a legal concept, right? That's why it uses the word speak here whenever we end the psalm. So speaking with your adversaries in the gate is a legal concept in scripture. Let's look a little bit at that. Uh, most of Ruth chapter four, we're not gonna read it all, but most of Ruth chapter four takes place in the gates of Bethlehem where Boaz is negotiating for Ruth, right, and Naomi's property. When Absalom, right, this is, this is a children who's been raised who becomes a weapon against you, right, but when Absalom conspires to overthrow David, where does he go, right? He goes to the gates of Jerusalem and he starts making such favorable judgments for what used to be David's friends um, that he steals the hearts of Israel, right? So Absalom began to turn people against David, but he did that by going to the gates of the city and becoming a person of influence. Another place we see this is in Joshua at the gates of a city of refuge. And I'm just gonna read that in Joshua chapter 20, verse four. And when he flees to one of those cities, okay, this is talking about a man who had either accidentally or unintentionally killed someone. And he was seeking a righteous judgment. So Joshua 20, verse four. And when he flees to one of those cities and stands at the entrance of the gate of the city and declares his case in the hearing of the elders of that city, they shall take him into the city as one of them and give him a place that they may dwell among them, right? So here we have a man who's accidentally or unintentionally killed somebody and he's seeking a righteous judgment. And so he goes to the gates of the city and seeks someone to protect him from the avenger. So the gate of the city in all of these cases is where the elders of the city, the rulers of the city would make judicial declarations. This was the place from which the city was governed. The prophet Amos speaks directly to this when he's calling Israel to repentance in Amos chapter five. Beginning with verse 10, he says, they hate the one who rebukes in the gate and they abhor the one who speaks uprightly. The house of Israel had turned away from God and therefore they hated his law and the few righteous leaders that remained in the gate speaking uprightly. So they hated his law and they hated the people who were still there speaking righteousness. And he goes on to provide them with the solution in verse 15. Hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. So within the context of Psalm 127, it seems apparent here that speaking with enemies in the gate is not talking necessarily about foreign enemies, right? Attacking the city from outside the gates. This is more directly talking about domestic enemies, right? This is not talking about foreign enemies coming in from outside the gate. It's more directly talking about domestic enemies. And these arrows are grown children who are fighting for justice and righteousness in the city gates, right? In the places of rulership, in the places of governance. And as I said before, we're talking about a city, but don't get too hung up that it's only in the city, right? Go 
understand the word house, we could be talking about the places of leadership in any institution. So these are grown children that will defend the culture that the previous generation has been blessed with, right? They're gonna defend the culture that their fathers have helped build, right? That God has blessed their fathers. They're gonna defend the, gener- the, they're gonna defend the culture that the previous generation has been blessed with. These are children that will continue to build on the foundation of God's word and will be thankful to him when it works, right? They're gonna be thankful to God when it works. They're gonna be thankful for what they've been blessed with and they're gonna continue to be thankful to God whenever the continued building works. They are helping in the building and the guarding of God's city. So these are children that are loyal. They're certainly loyal to their family and they're loyal to their city, but more importantly, they're loyal to their God. Remember, this is a house that the Lord has built. This is a house that is built on the foundation of the word of God, right? This is a house in which Christ is the glue that holds it together, right? They're not in the gate simply fighting for their own best interests, right? They're not in the gate showing partiality to their own home, right? They're in the gate fighting for the word of God. They're fighting for Christ. They're fighting for truth and righteousness based off of the word of Christ. So remember that Christ is the glue that holds this house together. So given all of this, allow me to read the Psalm once again and I'll offer a brief summary conclusion. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. So first, remember what I said about this psalm being right in the middle of the Psalm of Ascents the Psalms of Ascents. There was no bigger event in the life of a devout Jew than to go up to the house of God to worship, right? There was no bigger event in their life than to go up for one of these three annual feasts. And these Psalms were sung as worship, but they were also songs, if you consider the context, that were sung in preparing their hearts to worship. And we should be ordering our weeks accordingly, right? Alan said this back when he was doing his uh, pouring concrete series at the first of the year. And then you heard Pastor Wilson say this here a few weeks ago. But the most important thing you do every week with your family is go up to the mountain of God to worship, right? Go up to the mountain of God to worship. So plan accordingly. Prepare your heart and mind. And if you're looking for something to read, pray, or sing, on Saturday night or Sunday morning, then the Psalms of Ascent would be a great place to start, right? They're they're very robust, easy to memorize. We sing several of them here, sang Psalm 134 today. So be ready to enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Second, all success is dependent upon God's blessing. If God is blessing something, then success is inevitable. And God blesses obedience. No matter what you're building, a family, a business, a school, a church, a city, there's no foundation to build on except for the word of God. Everything else is sinking sand. And when God does bless your work, give thanks to whom thanks is due. When you get full, don't get full of yourselves, right? When you get full, don't get full of yourselves. Build on God's word and thank him for the results. Third, don't believe the lie that children are more of a burden than a blessing, right? Don't believe this lie. The Psalm tells us here that children are a gift, they're an inheritance, they're a reward, and that they're a weapon. This is the way that God builds the house, right? This is the way in the long run that we win. 
God builds the house through our children. And last, raise up children that will become a snare to the enemies of Christ. This is the way that God defends the city. Raise up children that will become a snare to the enemies of Christ. Grown children who will defend the culture in the places of judgment and justice. By God's grace and without neglecting prayer, we accomplish this by doing exactly what we're fixing to say from Deuteronomy chapter six, and we say it every Sunday near the close of our worship. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart You shall teach them diligently to your children, shall talk of them when you sit in your homes, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. That passage goes on to say, you shall write them as doorposts, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.